Hi there. Wouldn't it be awesome if you could find all your summary under 10 minutes for footprints without feet in one single video? Well, ta-da! This is what that is. Here you'll find all your summaries for all your chapters from Footprints Without Feet. Give this video a listen to revise all these chapters before your exams. So what are you waiting for? Let's get right to it. Today, we will be going over the summary of A Triumph of Surgery, which is your chapter one from Footprints Without Feet. So, let's get right to it. The chapter A Triumph of Surgery is about a dog named Tricky, who was always indulged by his rich mistress, Mrs. Pumphrey, with tasty and really unhealthy treats several times a day. Out of love, she would overfeed Tricky. Gradually, Tricky gained a lot of weight and became lazy. He hardly exercised or went out for a walk due to his bloated structure. In due course of time, he became bulky and his lack of movement worried Mrs. Pumphrey. That's when she consulted Mr. James Herriot, a veterinary surgeon for treatment of a lethargic, lazy and overweight dog. Mr. Herriot was shocked to see Tricky's condition and took him to the hospital. He knew Mrs. Pumphrey's overindulgence would never let her pet dog lead a healthy lifestyle. He took the dog along with him and put him on a hospital bed. The dog didn't move for the first two days and didn't eat any food either. On the third day, Tricky went outside and played with other bigger dogs in the hospital. He ate the food that was given to them and also licked the bowls of other dogs for the leftover food. Mr. Harriet gave a balanced diet to Tricky along with plenty of physical exercise. Gradually, obviously, Tricky's condition started improving and he started fighting and playing with the other dogs. He started fighting with the other dogs for their meals. Now his mistress, Mrs. Pumphrey, would send eggs so that her pet didn't starve and, you know, get enough energy to recover from the treatment. However, James Harriet and his partners would eat the eggs daily for breakfast. Further, Mrs. Pumphrey also sent bottles of wine to enrich Tricky's blood. But those again were consumed by Mr. Harriet and his partners. He felt sorry for eating the food that was sent by Mrs. Pomfrey for Tricky, but he also knew that they were very unhealthy for the dog. Soon, Tricky started showing signs of improvement and the vet decided to call the wealthy lady, Mrs. Pomfrey. Now, when she arrived at the hospital to fetch her pet, Tricky was very happy and jumped on her. Mrs. Pumphrey was filled with gratitude towards Mr. Harriet for curing her dog and felt that she couldn't thank him enough for the wonder he had done to her pet. She felt that this change in Tricky was indeed a triumph of surgery. Little did she know that all Tricky really needed was some healthy food and some exercise. Alright, that brings us to the end of our summary. Today, we will be going over the summary of the thief story, which is chapter 2 from Footprints Without Feet. So, let's get right to it. Now, as you all know, the thief story is written by Ruskin Bond. This story is about a young 15-year-old boy, Hari Singh, which might not be his real name, who befriended people in order to rob them. One day, he met Anil during a wrestling match. Anil was this 25-year-old man who was leading a normal life. He was a struggling writer who would make small money with his writing talent. Hari flattered Anil by trying to befriend him and asking him for some work. Anil asked Hari if he could cook, to which the young boy replied affirmatively. Hearing this, Anil took him to his room and promised to teach Hari how to read, write and add numbers. Soon, Anil found out that Hari actually couldn't cook and even taught him how to cook delicious meals. Sometimes, Anil would give a rupee to Hari as a tip for all of his efforts. One fine day, Anil received a bundle of rupee notes for his published articles. He kept this money under his blanket and Hari happened to notice this. At midnight, when Anil was fast asleep, Hari stealthily or sneakily slipped his hand and stole the money kept under the mattress. He immediately left for the railway station to board a train to Lucknow. 
Unfortunately, he missed the train and wandered across the streets. As it was pouring and raining heavily, he got completely drenched. Soon, Hari began to feel agitated and regretful for stealing money from an honest man like Anil who treated him so well. He felt guilty for cheating Anil who taught him how to read and write his own name and add numbers. Suddenly, Hari Singh had a change of heart and he decided that he wants to return to Anil. Although the notes had become soggy and wet due to the rain, he kept the money in the same spot from where he retrieved it. The following day, when he woke up, he found Anil was normal as usual. The young man offered Hari 50 rupees and said that he had rightfully earned it. Anil further said that he would pay Hari regularly. However, when Hari touched the money, he realized that the money was still damp. Hari understood that Anil knew what he did the previous night, but the young man still didn't treat him with disgust or hand him over to the police. On the contrary, Anil promised to teach Hari how to write full sentences. After this incident, Hari Singh was filled with gratitude and respect for Anil and he decided to mend his ways and become a noble human being just like Anil. That brings us to the end of the summary, a very sweet story about the relationship between two people and how you need to forgive people when they realize their own mistakes. Today, we are going over Chapter 3, The Midnight Visitor, a very interesting story, so let's get to it. The Midnight Visitor is a detective story written by Robert Arthur. The story starts off with Fowler, a young writer who is disappointed at meeting a spy who did not fit the description he had in mind. Secret agent Ausible and Fowler had gone out to spend an evening together. As the two men talked, Ausible told him that Fowler must have imagined him to be a secret agent who dealt with espionage and danger and envisioned mysterious figures in the night, the crack of pistols, etc. But Ausible was a chubby-looking spy who spoke moderate French and German with an American accent. While Fowler was disillusioned, Ausible told him that he would be receiving an important document for which many have risked their lives. They headed towards Ausible's room. When they entered the room, Fowler was startled to see a man holding a small automatic pistol halfway across the room. Ausible immediately recognized the other man to be Max, a secret agent. Max had come to demand for the report related to missiles that Ausible was expecting. Meanwhile, Fowler was in a state of shock and this was by far the most exciting experience for him to meet a secret agent in such a manner. In the meantime, Ausible began to lie about the balcony. He said that this was the second time someone had entered through it. Max denied this and said that he had entered through the door. Ausible continued to talk about the balcony beneath the window of the room to divert Max's attention. Just then, somebody knocked at the door. The thumping became louder and more frequent. Ausible said that the police might have come to visit him as they did on a regular basis. Hearing this, Max was confused and while he pointed his gun towards the two men in the room, he said he would wait in the balcony until the police left. Max warned that he would shoot them if they didn't listen to him. Saying so, he jumped out of the window and suddenly there was a loud scream. Meanwhile, Ausible opened the door and the waiter brought some wine that he had ordered. The waiter kept the wine bottle, glasses and tray on top of the table and left. Fowler was surprised to see all this and asked him about the police. To this, Ausible lied about the police as he was trying to intimidate Max. Fowler again asked that Max might be waiting in the balcony to which Ausible said there was no balcony attached to his window. He cooked up the entire story about the balcony in order to convince Max to believe him, which he blindly did. This story exhibits how quick-witted Ausible took advantage of the dangerous situation and was successful in making Max nervous. 
Distraught, Max jumped out of the window and fell to his death unknowingly. Although Ausubel didn't look like a well-groomed spy like we see in movies, he was an ingenious secret agent. He outwitted Max and successfully saved himself and his friend Fowler from a life-threatening situation. That brings us to the end of the summary. Now you know that it's not just about the looks, it's also about the brain. Today we will be going over a question of trust. So let's get to it. A Question of Trust is a story about a thief, Horace Danby, who was known to be a good citizen. He was an unmarried 50-year-old man who used to work as a locksmith. Although he was a respectable man, he was not completely honest. He had a liking for rare and fancy books and would purchase them by any means. To pursue this expensive hobby, he would rob a safe once every year and purchase the expensive books covertly through an agent. He would chalk out a well-devised plan before making any burglary attempt. This time, he had his eyes on a house at Shotover Grange and he had carefully studied its rooms, electric wiring, its paths and the garden for two weeks. When the people of the house were in London and two caretakers of the house had gone to watch a movie, Horace realized this was the best time to execute his act. He came out from behind a wall of the garden and entered the house with all of his tools packed in his bag. He had picked a key from the hook on the kitchen door. He quickly wore his gloves to avoid leaving any fingerprints behind. He took the key from the hook and opened the door. He saw the dog and called it by its name, Sherry. Sherry wagged its tail and did not trouble him. Danby knew the safe was hidden behind a poor painting in the drawing room. There was a beautiful vase full of flowers kept on the table. He was allergic to the fragrance of flowers. He tickled his nose and kept sneezing repeatedly, getting hay fever. He took out his tools and cut the burglar alarm. As he sneezed again loudly due to the fragrance of the flowers, he heard the voice of a young lady standing on the doorway behind him. The lady was dressed in red and seemed to be the house owner's wife. She managed to convince Horace to believe her. She said that she had come there without notice to collect her jewels as she wanted to wear those at a party that night. Hmm. Danby was frightened that the lady might hand him over to the police, so he requested her to let him go. She told him that she would allow him to leave only if he opened the safe for her as she left all jewels in it. She mentioned that she had forgotten the safe's number combination and didn't know how to unlock it. Danby offered to help her and open the safe without his gloves on. <coughs> the young lady immediately took out all the jewels. Horace Danby left the house and went home happily, assuming that he had escaped imprisonment. <coughs> However, a policeman arrested him for the third day for the burglary of the jewels at Shotover Grange. Horace Danby's fingerprints were found all over the robbed place. Later, he confessed to committing the crime and that he had opened the safe for the young lady in the house, but didn't steal the jewels inside. In reality, it so happened that the lady was also a thief and she convinced Horace to break open the safe for her. When he told this story to the police, no one believed him, since the owner's wife was a 60-year-old woman, not the one Danby mentioned in his statement. In no time, the police arrested him and he was put behind bars for the robbery case. He became the assistant librarian in the prison. He often thought of the charming, cunning young lady who was also a thief like him and tricked him to believe her. Henceforth, whenever anyone mentioned honor among thieves, he would get very angry and upset. That brings us to the end of our summary. Today, we will be going over the summary of Chapter 5 from Footprints Without Feet, which is Footprints Without Feet. So, without further ado, 
Let's get to it. Ah, so Footprints Without Feet is an interesting story written by Herbert George Wells. Now, this story is about a brilliant scientist named Griffin who had developed a drug that could make a man invisible. He was successful in his experiment and developed a formula that had the power of invisibility. So by consuming the drug, a man could become transparent and could not be seen with the naked eye. Griffin carried out the experiment on himself, so he gulped the drug and his body became transparent like a sheet of glass. Inadvertently, or as a result, he stepped in mud and the fresh muddy imprints of his feet were all over the place. It was first seen by two young boys who followed his footprints until they became fainter and disappeared altogether. Although Griffin was an outstanding scientist, he was a lawless man. His landlord disliked him and had asked him to leave the house. In vengeance, Griffin set the house on fire and soon wandered around the streets without food, money and clothes. Owing to his invisibility, no one could see him and as he was walking down the streets, he started feeling cold and entered a big London shopping centre to warm himself. After the stores were shut down, he picked up some comfortable clothes to warm himself and fed himself with cold meat and some espresso from a nearby restaurant. Later, he slept on a pile of quilts in the store. The following morning, some associates started approaching him and he removed all of his clothes immediately and became invisible again. Now, as Griffin wandered without clothes in the chilly weather, he could feel the biting cold and decided to take some clothes from a theatre company. Soon, he found an appropriate shop and wore bandages around his forehead, a false nose, dark glasses, big bushy side whiskers and a huge hat. Then, he went to a shop's shopkeeper's store and stole all his money. He realised that staying in a crowded city like London could be difficult for him, so he thought of moving to the Iping village. He had booked two rooms at the local inn in the village and reached there by boarding a train from London. It was quite an unusual experience for the villagers to expect an outsider with this strange appearance who had come to stay at the hotel during winter. Mrs. Hall, the wife of the landlord of the inn, tried to be friendly with him, but Griffin did not want to talk to her. Soon enough, his money was exhausted and he started stealing to sustain himself. Due to his suspicious appearance, the inn owner and his wife attempted to check his room while he was away. Now, out of anger, Griffin damaged the furniture of the inn and threw it across the room towards them. The owner and his wife got scared, thinking that there were spirits around and their unusual guest was responsible for all of this chaos. Meanwhile, Mrs. Hall requested the town constable, Mr. Jaffers, to inquire about the identity of this peculiar individual and arrest him for damaging her furniture and her inn. Now, this annoyed Griffin further and so he decided to reveal his identity as he started unwrapping his bandages, whiskers, spectacles and nose. Now everyone was shocked to see this as there was no normal human being hidden behind the bandages. The constable could not catch hold of Griffin as he took off all of his garments, became invisible and disappeared in thin air. That brings us to the end of this summary. In today's session, we will be covering Chapter 6 from Footprints Without Feet, which is the making of a scientist. Let's get right to it. Now, The Making of a Scientist was written by Robert W. Peterson. This prose is about a renowned scientist, Richard Ebright, 
who was a bright yet curious child from the early years of his life. He was very fond of collecting butterflies and when he was in second grade, he had already collected 25 species of butterflies in his hometown. His mother always encouraged him in his efforts and gifted him a book named The Travels of Monarch X. The book was a turning point in his life as it opened him to the world of science. It explained how monarch butterflies would migrate to Central America and made him more eager to explore about the species. Soon, he participated in the county science fair and understood that he needed to do something exceptional. He continued with his efforts until he made a place for himself in the fair with valid experiments. Later, in his 8th grade project, he tried to discover the disease caused by a virus that nearly killed most of the monarch caterpillars every year. Ebright assumed that a beetle may be the carrier of the disease, so he started breeding caterpillars along with beetles. However, he didn't get any results from the experiment. Nevertheless, he exhibited the experiment in the county science fair and won the competition that year. During the second year of high school, Ebright started his scientific research about the discovery of a mysterious insect hormone, which led to his brand new theory on the life of cells. His experiment was to find the main purpose of the 12 tiny golden spots on a monarch pupa. His project won first prize in a county science fair and he got an opportunity to work at an entomology lab in Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. As a junior in high school, he went on with his upgraded experiments on the monarch pupa and finally was successful in identifying the chemical structure of hormones. One fine day, while he was checking the x-ray photos of the chemical structure of a hormone, he understood how the cell could read the blueprint of its DNA. E. Bright and his roommate in college, James R. Wong, worked day and night and drew pictures and constructed plastic models of molecules to illustrate how DNA works. This was a major leap in Ebright's career as he secured a graduation degree from Harvard with the highest honours and stood second in a class of 1,510 students. His work was also published in a science magazine. Soon, he became a graduate student researcher at Harvard Medical School and started working on other experiments. Richard Ebright was a straight a student in high school. Besides, he took interest in debate, public speaking and was also a good canoeist and an all-rounder outdoor person. He always had a competitive nature and zeal to give his best to everything that he put his hands to. Out and out, he had all the key ingredients of a brilliant scientist, starting with a first-rate mind, blended with curiosity and a mix of willpower to win for the right reasons. That brings us to the end of our summary. Today, as you can see, we will be covering your chapter 8 from Footprints Without Feet, which is the necklace. So let's get started. The Necklace, written by Guy de Maupassant, is a short story about Matilda Loisel and her husband, who lived in a small yet cosy flat. Matilda's husband worked as a clerk in the office of the Board of Education and he loved his wife. They couldn't afford a luxurious lifestyle and led a very simple life. Matilda was unhappy about her condition. She felt disappointed and sad about their financial condition. She wanted to be rich and wear beautiful dresses with matching expensive jewellery, but she didn't have any of this. Now, one fine day, Matilda's husband brought her an invitation to a grand ball party at the minister's residence. He expected his wife to be excited upon seeing the invitation letter. 
But when Matilda saw the invite, she expressed her resentment and anger over it and she threw the letter aside and started sobbing and crying over her condition. When asked, she complained of not having a party dress to wear on such a grand event. She wanted to look beautiful at the party so that everyone should admire her. Seeing her condition, her loving husband gave her all his savings of 400 francs to buy a beautiful dress. He had saved that amount for buying a rifle for himself but gave the money to his wife to buy her dress for the sake of her happiness. Soon, the week of the grand party approached. Matilda was anxious again. This time, she felt that she didn't have any matching precious jewellery to pair with her lovely dress. Her husband suggested she requested her friend Jean Forestier for a neck piece. Now, Matilda went to Jean's house immediately and borrowed a sparkling diamond necklace. Matilda went to the ball party with her husband and was really happy about her appearance. They enjoyed the party and were ready to head back home in the wee hours or very early hours of the morning. When they reached home, Matilda realized that the necklace was missing around her neck. She and her husband were panic-stricken that it might have fallen in the cab which they had boarded while returning from the party. Her husband immediately went to search the streets just in case it might have fallen there, but he couldn't find it anywhere. He approached the police and put up an advertisement in the newspapers offering a reward, but all of this went in vain. With no option left, Matilda's husband asked her to write a letter to Forestier and mention that the clasp had broken and she would return it once repaired. In the meantime, they successfully found a replica of the necklace and decided to replace it with the old one. However, the new necklace was very expensive and cost 36,000 francs. Matilda's father-in-law had left 18,000 francs for his son. They decided to borrow the rest of the money to buy the expensive necklace. They bought the necklace with all of the money they had and borrowed funds. In the next few years, their condition worsened due to the huge loan. They moved to a smaller place to live in and Matilda had to do all the household chores by herself to save money. Her husband worked odd hours in multiple jobs to repay the loan. Ten years passed and with that their appearances also changed due to the extreme workload and the harsh lifestyle that they were living. One day, Matilda met her friend, the one that she had borrowed the necklace from, who couldn't identify her as she looked tired and aged. Matilda revealed the truth about the diamond necklace and how she and her husband were left in ruins for repaying the loan of the expensive necklace. Hearing this, Forestier was stunned and told her that the necklace that she had lent her for the ball party was a fake necklace and was worth not more than 500 francs. Imagine getting to know that after 10 years of this. That brings us to the end of the summary. Today we will be covering Bholi from Footprints Without Feet, so let's get to it. Bholi was written by K.A. Abbas, who was a popular Indian film director, journalist and novelist known for his works in Hindi, Urdu and other languages. Now, this story is about a young girl named Sulekha who was popularly referred to as Bholi for her simple nature. So, at 10 months, she fell from a cot which had perhaps caused some damage to her brain. She used to stammer when she learned to talk. Bholi was born a pretty child, but then she suffered from smallpox that left dark pock marks on her face. The marks spoiled her appearance and people would often make fun of her because of her looks and because she stammered. Bholi's father, Ramlal, had seven children, out of which three were sons and four were daughters. Among all daughters, Bholi was the youngest. 
Her parents were worried about Bholi and how to get her married when she would grow older. One fine day, Tehsildar Sahib had come to perform an inaugural ceremony of primary school of a, for a primary school for girls in the village. And he told Ramlal to send all of his daughters to school. Now, when Ramlal discussed this with his wife, she objected and said that nobody would marry their daughters if they were sent to school, which was the mindset that a lot of people had in uh, those times and still do in some rural areas. So she agreed to send Bholi to school because she wasn't even sure if Bholi would ever get married because of her appearance and the fact that she stammered. Initially, Bholi was scared of going to school as she had never heard about it. However, on the first day of school, she was groomed properly and sent to school. Bholi realized that it must be a better place than her own home. When she reached school, she was elated and overjoyed to see girls of her age around. She wanted to make friends with them, but she was scared to talk to them. When the class teacher smilingly asked her name, she stammered in front of the entire class and started crying. But her teacher was a kind-natured lady and she encouraged her to tell her name again. Her teacher told her to put fear out of her heart and not be scared. She was finally able to tell her name. Her teacher gave her a few books with pictures and asked her to come to school every day. This gave Bholi a new ray of hope and assurance of a new and better life. So many years passed, the village developed and soon became a small town and saw many improvements around it. Soon, there was a marriage proposal for Bholi. The prospective bridegroom, Bishambar, was a limping old man with grown-up children. He, he was almost Bholi's father's age. However, Ramlal's family agreed for this alliance as they thought that Bholi would not get a better match than this. Bholi's elder sisters were envious of the great pomp and show at their younger sister's wedding. However, when the groom, Bishambar, was about to put the garland around bri the bride's neck, a woman slowly slipped the veil from Bholi's face. The groom was surprised to see the pock marks on her face and he refused to marry her without a dowry of 5,000 rupees. Now, Bholi's father, Ramlal, somehow arranged this amount, which was a huge amount for the time, and gave it to Bishambar. However, as the groom tried to garland the bride, Bholi held his hand and refused to marry such a mean and greedy coward. All the people present in the wedding were stunned to see Bholi speak so confidently and without stammering or stuttering. The groom felt insulted and returned to his village. Later, Bholi assured her father that she would take care of him and her mother in their old age and would become a teacher in the same school where she learned so many new and good things. Looking at this, Bholi's teacher, who was watching all of this from a distance, felt a deep sense of relief and satisfaction at Bholi's courage and confidence that she exhibited in front of so many people. That brings us to the end of this summary. Today, we will be covering the book that saved the earth. So, let's get right to it. Now, the book that saved the earth is actually a play written by Claire Bioko. It is uh, it starts off in the 25th century where sitting in the Museum of Ancient History, the historian, who is a character in the play, depicts the story of the Martians, people from aliens from Mars, who visited Earth in 2040 to invade the planet. The play consists of characters having strange names such as Mighty Chief Think Tank, Apprentice Noodle, Captain Omega, Lieutenant Iota, and Sergeant Oop. Think Tank would consider himself as the most powerful and intelligent fellow among all the Martians and decides to visit Earth with his team. He always thinks that since he has a big balloon head, he is the most intelligent of all and constantly wants to be praised for it. 
He and his team are eager to know how the earthlings, which is the name they've given to people living on the earth, live and how the Martians can put the planet under the generous Martian rulership. So they arrived at the Centerville Public Library on Earth, which was full of books, but they were unable to understand the purpose of these books because they didn't know what books were uh, and why they were kept in these shelves. So to exhibit his intelligence and acumen, the mighty think tank tells his crew that earthlings are fond of eating. So these things on the shelves are probably sandwiches. Soon after, he orders Captain Omega, Lieutenant Iota and Sergeant Oop to eat the book. Now, Captain Omega and Lieutenant Iota cleverly transfer this responsibility of eating a book on Sergeant Oop's shoulders. Having no choice, Sergeant Oop eats the corner of the book, but he does not like the taste. He confirms to the mighty think tank that it is not delicious at all. From this, the crew realizes that the book is not meant for eating. Now, after some time, Apprentice Noodle suggests to the mighty think tank that the book is probably being used for communication with ears. So they all try to hear the book by holding it close to their ears and yet no sound comes from it. Later, Noodle suggests to Think Tank that the book may be used for communication with eyes. The mighty Think Tank agrees and orders the entire crew members to open and read the book. The name of the book is Mother Goose, which is a famous children's rhymes book. However, they are unable to understand how to read it. In no time, Apprentice Noodle reminds Think Tank that the Mars Chemical Department had given them some vitamin pills to boost intelligence. So Think Tank immediately orders his crew to have those pills. The crew pop in the capsules before reading the book. Soon, Sergeant Oop starts reading the nursery rhymes in the book and they start taking the literal meanings of the lines in the rhymes. So they read several times and think that the earthlings have now discovered how to combine agriculture and mining and have reached a high level of civilization. Then Oop reads the rhyme Humpty Dumpty and all of them see the picture of Humpty that resembles Think Tank. Seeing this, Think Tank is horrified to know that earthlings have identified him already and want to kill him. From all the information gathered about Earthlings, the mighty think tank calls his Martian crew and says they should postpone the idea of invading Earth for the time being. So he asks his crew to run away from the place immediately without leaving a trace and evacuate the entire planet of Mars. He orders his team to head towards Alpha Centauri, a hundred million miles away. Thus, an old book of nursery rhymes Mother Goose saves the earth from the Martian invasion.